uh, welcome to all of you out on this uh, very snowy uh, Wisconsin uh, uh, evening. It's uh, already our second or third day of snow here in Wisconsin, so hey, that's how we roll. And we have a, a, a full house, uh, so snow doesn't stop us because you know we do fish through ice um, here in Wisconsin. And we are just delighted to have you, uh, Jane McElvey, here for this talk tonight on this very, very important topic of, of unions and the future of our society. And um, I just want to start off by saying that I have had the pleasure of knowing Jane for uh, many decades. And uh, I've, I've followed her work. I'm a great admirer of, of the work that she has done in, organizer, in, in organizing. And even before that, uh, she was a student leader coming out of uh, uh, SUNY Buffalo. Uh, and then working with SASU, which is the state student organization there. And she did wonderful things there and then continued on to become one of the most premier uh, labor organizers in the country. Uh, someone who knows how to develop worker power, who knows how to uh, be a real practitioner of the art of organizing. And not only does she do that so well, but she's been able to turn that into uh, an intellectual pursuit in which she has been able been written three now books um, about organizing and unions and the importance of unions and through those that combination of of practitioner of organizing and building worker power and her beautiful writing and a writing style she's able to bring these lessons to all of us um, here today through talks like this and also through her writings and so um, I'm just, uh, just delighted to be here for uh, this talk. And to kick things off, uh, we are, we are at, at a place in history where uh, our future is not certain in terms of which way we are going to go. Uh, we are, have some of the largest inequality in terms of income inequality than we've, that we've had since 1929. And so Jane starts out her book um, by really talking about the solution to our problems really is, she says, but unions, Americans may finally be coming to realize, are absolutely essential to democracy. So Jane, why don't you start us off in talking about that a little bit? Sure. And do I have to hold, can people hear fine? Can you hear from my, great. Yeah. Uh, first of all, by the way, it is great to see all of you on a snowy night. It'd be great to see you on a not snowy night, and it's definitely great to see uh, Stephanie. So, um, I, and I'm thankful to the Havens Wright Center for bringing me here, and I sort of feel like um, the theme of the talk, which is the title of the last chapter in the book that's coming out soon, um, As Goes Union, So Goes the Republic, uh, is a window into Wisconsin, by the way, right? If we're looking at what, what's been going down in your state, it's like, you know, the laboratory for the attack on the entire working class and democracy at the same time. Yeah. So um, I, I like want to just acknowledge what I imagine has been an, a hell of a time uh, in this state um, since 2011 um, and salute um, everyone. And it actually mattered to me to like engage with the state AFL-CIO when I came here because part of why I wrote this new book, um, and I'm going to get to the I'm going to get to that point. But part of why I think I wrote it is because there has been this discussion going on in the United States, really strongly for the last 10 or 15 or even 20 years, that like unions are last century. We don't need unions. Um, we can have the, like, we can just like pass minimum wage laws and pass some laws and I don't know, advocate a little bit, do some lawsuits and do some like little grassroots organ, like, and I think people have been saying this crap for so long when what's really obvious is that we're taking it in the neck as the working class unless and until we actually figure out how to build solidarity among workers and between them and rebuild really strong unions. That's the, that seems to me like a fact. Um, and it's definitely not a fact. <laughs> but to me, it's like a fact of the history of this country. So I think I wrote the book as like a giant poke in the eye um, for a couple of reasons. One is, I think when we look back at the history of the New Deal, like when we look back at the moment when the country was as polarized and in as much trouble as we are today, 
which was the late 1920s and the early 1930s, uh, when you know um, wealth inequality was the same as it is today. Um, part of what I would do in the book, actually in all the books, is that wealth inequality tracks to political power inequality, right? Like it's a power imbalance in American society. And the super rich and the corporations have way too much right now, um, and we have way too little. So we've faced moments like this before, and the most analogous one, I think, is the early 1930s in the United States. Um, so, and, and what happened in the 1930s, in the early 1930s, was very similar to now in terms of a dialogue that was going on in the country. There was this idea that unions were dead, they were, re they were as weak as we are right now, nationally, basically. Um, there was this conversation going on back then that unions were done, that the economy was changed, like all the same stuff we hear today. Like, the economy was changing, society was changing, unions weren't relevant anymore. There was a huge speech in 1932 that I quote uh, in this book by the most prestigious economic association in the country, where the president of it to, uh, announces, proclaims in the annual speech to his association of economists in the United States, that unions were done, that the structural conditions for trade unions in America were done. This is 1932, just saying. Uh, and what happens on the heels of that brilliant prediction um, is that, you know, we elect Franklin Delano Roosevelt, we elect FDR, um, and unions do what I think unions need to do now, um, which is strike the crap out of the country um, and build a level of solidarity and create a level of chaos that made the country ungovernable until they passed the National Labor Relations Act. Um, and I think. If you had said to people in 1932 that unions would explode within the same decade, people would, you know, people just would have said, not, not a chance. You know what I mean? Unions, we had them in the 1800s, they're sort of last century, you know. Um, and then we had the most explosive period of growth in the history of uh, working class power in this country. So I think part of what we came to realize in 35 and in that period is that. There was this notion in America that you could have like civil, civil society and civil democracy. And what we came to realize by 1929 when the super rich and the corporate elite crashed the entire economy, sound familiar? Yeah. Right, when they just wreaked <laughs> havoc and crashed the entire economy, um, is that it turns out that actually many very important decisions that are made in the United States every day are not made in the halls uh, the official halls of power. They're made in corporate boardrooms. But actually many crucial decisions about democracy, plant location, where jobs will be, and so much more are made in corporate boardrooms. And there was a concept under the New Deal and FDR that actually democracy couldn't work unless there was industrial democracy. Unless workers had a way to check the power of the corporate elite in the workplace. And that democracy had to play out in two arenas. One was voting in civic elections, and the other was in the workplace. And that's what the creation of the National Labor Relations Act was in 1935. So we've gotten so far away from that, but I think if you look at what's been happening in this country for the last, I'm gonna put a pinpoint on like since the 1970s, um, which in some ways I talk more about in my second book than this one, but tracing the, rise of the corporate, the power of the corporate boardroom again uh, in this country through the active destruction of the unions, right? It's been a deliberate, absolutely methodological, as methodical as it was starting in 2011 with Act 10 in this state is what happened across this country, first to the private sector, frankly in the manufacturing sector beginning in the 70s, uh, and once they wiped out most of the private sector manufacturing jobs, uh, they turn their guns on the public sector, right? The largest sector left of unionized workers. So I, I think we're at the point again where we realize CEOs, shareholders, and corporations can not be trusted uh, to run the economy. And the only way around letting them run the economy and make, in some ways, more decisions than elected state legislators make is by restoring a fundamental right to strike in this country and exercising it. Um, and I don't, I really don't, I think economic inequality leads to political inequality. It just, it just, ha it's gonna happen every time. So every time 
every single damn time we see huge economic inequality, we see corporations essentially taking over and running the state, which is what has happened uh, in Wisconsin, and it's what's happening um, all over the country. So I think that's the, the, the opening argument I'm trying to make, is that it li we literally can't have a functioning democracy unless workers have democracy in the workplace. Like, it's just not going to work. And I think that when uh, you have a chance to all read this book, and this book will be coming <laughs> out, uh, when will it be couple months. coming out? In a couple For, of months. Formerly the 1st of January. But. So this is the gallery, uh, the gallery copy, right? And uh, I, I, I just finished uh, reading this book, and I think that we are going to find, once you all have this in your hands and are able to read it and study it, that this is going to be a groundbreaking work that is going to really make the case that the only way forward to have a just and equal and more fair society is to build strong democratic unions. And this idea that there's a substitute, yeah. that the idea that there's a substitute for building strong worker power is really on its face wrong. And uh, Jane goes into this in depth in her book but one of the things that she says in the beginning, she says, if you believe that lawsuits or legal tactics are the main platform available for a positive change, stop reading this book and go play with your kids or grandkids. <laughs> Resign their future and yours to one with more extreme storms and vast unemployment, but you know that it is not inevitable, not a long shot. So can you talk about how that, uh, the, this, this notion that has sort of taken hold in a lot of, frankly, progressive uh, arenas that they believe, that many believe that there's a substitute for a strong unionization. Yeah, it's super deep. I think it's so deep. I mean, I want to start by acknowledging one uh, problem, which is um, we, and I say we because I'm a lifetime trade unionist. Uh, I mean, I, I come out of, I grew up in, uh, uh, a building trades house, some like four generations of building trades leadership on my father's side, um, and then uh, teachers unions, you know, on the female side. So um, I had the happy, the happy <laughs> marriage of both, uh, and I grew up on picket lines um, my entire childhood. So, um, you know, I think that there has been, there's been a cons I mean, it starts in the 60s in some ways. I mean, it starts in a bunch of places, but I think it, it begins to develop um, in the 60s. Uh, well, I don't know where you can start. It begins to develop in so many places. But let's just say that starting in the 1970s, there is this idea that, there's several ideas, like we passed civil rights legislation, workers have basic rights in a lot of beauty contracts, and the standard of living is getting better, not for everyone, but for a lot of people. Um, and, and, and an, an attack begins um, on unions. And I would say, we have to be honest and acknowledge that s we brought a little bit of it on ourselves. Um, like, not having fully democratic trade unions has left us a bit vulnerable um, at times to some criticism that is deserved. Um, so I'm talking about rebuilding powerful, strong democratic trade unions. Um, and, which is both what I inherited in my family legacy and also the ones, what I've helped to build, right, are like small d democratic unions where workers have rights, they make decisions, they make the most important decisions in the union, which is about the terms of the contract, you know, you're all involved. Um, so I think there was this constructed uh, move by, in one part, uh, philanthropy, like private wealth, through foundations, where they began to construct a narrative that we didn't need unions anymore, that what we needed was um, just nice advocacy groups that would advocate uh, on behalf of American workers. And that, you know, there was this super careful construction of a narrative um, that we don't need unions, that they're too powerful, that they impede progress, that they get in the way. Certainly if you were a teachers union, the entire failing classrooms were blamed on teachers unions in this country as opposed to, oh, massive cutbacks in spending on public education over the last 40 years, right? So um, I think there was a very intense narrative constructed in part on the right wing, by the right wing, by the Koch brothers, the Koch industries. Like, so it was coming from multiple places, oddly. But the liberal side of it was like philanthropy. Um, and sometimes like liberal philanthropy, 
where people said, we need everything but unions, essentially. And I feel like part of what I argue in this book in several places is, you know, that I got to the point where I would, I would listen to people I knew in my own sort of social circles who would say, yeah, unions were great last century, but now it's better. We can have worker centers, we can have advocacy centers, we can like sue if they violate the law, we can raise the floor, that's better, a better alternative to like contentious unions. Um, and of course what it all came down to was the fact that they didn't actually want workers having democratic spaces to actually control uh, the future of our lives. And I think it's pretty simple. And every attempt at substituting for unions like every attempt at substituting for unions has frankly been a colossal failure. Um, and I think if you fast forward to where we are today, you know, we have a Supreme Court that's gonna rule against everyone in this room for the rest of my life, um, for sure. Um, we have generally the appeals courts and the federal courts, there's been like a thousand judges appointed who are anti-worker judges just since 2016 but starting with the highest court in the land. It is an anti-worker Supreme Court, and they're a bit young. And we don't even know if one of them is gonna make it between now and the next election, right? So um, say anything else you want about them. They have already shown they are viciously anti-union and viciously anti-working class. So that's our court system. So we definitely can't rely on that. The electoral system, obviously Wisconsin is, you know, case in point, um, is politically horrifically skewed, both by the role of corporate money in politics and then the rigged election system of the wildly gerrymandered districts yeah. in Wisconsin. So voting our way out of the problem seems not all that likely when I look at the power structure analysis of your state or most states. And to me, quite honestly, it winds up leaving us back with one option, um, which is the strike. And I think we're going to have to have a hell of a lot more strikes intensely. Um, I think the, the beginning of the strikes that we're seeing um, in both red, so-called red states, I don't care what state they are, right? California, West Virginia, Arizona, Colorado, Kentucky, by the way. Like, I think that where we're seeing illegal strikes, I'm going to use that word, because they're going to have to be illegal in most states. Um, we're seeing massive illegal strikes in places that we haven't seen illegal war strikes in my lifetime. Um, and I think that we have to have a really serious discussion about uh, what that's going to look like and what it's going to mean. And if you look at, again, if you go back to how we got out of the first Great Depression um, by electing FDR and then unions saying, right, we've got to make the country ungovernable. We've got to pick key states and key cities, because we know we couldn't do it all over America, which can't right now. So like, where are the states and where are the cities where we can strategically actually bring the region into favorable chaos for workers and unfavorable for the business elite and create the kind of crisis that was done in this country in 1933 and 1934. Something that, is, that I talk about in the book is that I feel like the history of the New Deal that I always heard about as a young trade union organizer, but also, frankly, as the daughter of, uh, in a trade union household, um, was like the Detroit strikes that began in 1936. Like, the big strikes began in 1936. The truth is, well, there were many waves of big strikes in this country, but the, strike, the strikes that led to workers getting the right to have unions and to forcing employers into the negotiations table were the strikes in 1933 and 1934. And we hear very little about them. So I'm lifting them up um, in this book. So, because be, being able to create, when I was, a, when I, my first organizing job, my organizing director said to me, McAlevey, if you can, if you, meaning if you and the workers, if you can't create a crisis going into contract talks, like if you can't create an actual crisis for the employer, good luck winning anything. Yeah. <laughs> and if you can create a crisis for the employer, have fun. Like that was the, you got two choices. Um, and so learning, literally like learning how to create a crisis for the boss that we were fighting uh, taught me a lot of lessons, which was actually when we build 90 or 95% unity across the workforce and have a credible strike threat, and or have to pull the trigger and go on a massive strike, we win. Like that's my, 
that's my early lessons and I'm sticking to it. And it's been true my entire life um, in the labor movement. So when we're strike ready, when we work with the community, when we do all those things, we actually can win. And that's what we're seeing across the country. Um, and it's so strange to juxtapose it with Wisconsin, to be in Wisconsin, because you've just been in living through this hellacious beatdown. And elsewhere around you, there's an extraordinary rising happening right now, where workers are saying, we're just, we're done. We don't care if it's legal, illegal. And the point of all the strikes that just happened in red states that are very, that very anti-union and anti-strike laws, like anti-strike legislation, is that the lesson was that to overcome the legal barriers, frankly, of those kind of strikes meant people had to get to 100% out. That's 100% out, right? In West Virginia, they survived an illegal strike because they were 100% out, 34,000 workers, cooks, bus drivers, and teachers together, and shut down every school in the state in what was totally illegal, like it's completely legal. So the question is, why didn't they have legal injunctions? Why didn't they get fired? Why didn't they get disciplined? They didn't because they were 100% out and it's hard to punish 34,000 people overnight, right? Like that's the old concept of, now it's hard work to do it, but to some degree that's, you know. And Jane, you talk about the West Virginia teacher strike in the book, and you talk about the lessons that they had in the earlier strike, where only, I believe right. the teachers went that's out right. on strike, but everyone else was um, uh, and not on strike. The, the cooks, the librarians, the, the maintenance people, right. they were not on strike. But what they were able to do in this most recent round was to not only make sure that everyone was together on this, they actually also uh, worked together with the community. And so they had this, uh, and just thinking about why they were striking uh, was really interesting to me. We in Wisconsin are very familiar with uh, the push for voucher schools, the push for um, uh, charter schools, and really we're one of the birthplaces in Milwaukee around the, the voucher movement. But in West Virginia, uh, Jane talks about that they actually wanted to hand out vouchers, not just to go to a voucher school, but to homeschool <laughs> your kids. So in, a, in a areas where, where, where deep poverty, this was a real uh, threat to public education in and of itself. And so you talk about in detail how they took on that, the, those powerful interests yeah. in, in that strike. Yeah, and I, and I think the key, the key to West Virginia, which gets not, no, not well noticed, um, every time I hear someone call it a teacher strike, like it puts like hair on my back. I'm like, <laughs> was it a teacher strike? It was an education worker strike. Like that strike. So I began to cold call superintendents of schools during the strike. Just like, I don't know, I just got an idea one day. Like I'm, I'm trying to figure out why there's no legal injunction. It's four, four days into a totally illegal strike, and I'm just sitting in San Francisco like, why the hell hasn't there been an injunction yet? Because in the 1990 strike, in the last big strike in West Virginia, it was teachers only. And they did get legally injunctioned back to work. Like, the strike ended in kind of a flop, they got a raise, um, but they didn't get very much, and they were mandated back to work, right? Because it wasn't all out. They didn't have all teachers. And they didn't have anyone but teachers, but they didn't even have all the teachers. So the contrast to 2018 is so radically beautifully different. And it was the deliberate action of a bunch of smart, forward-thinking teachers who said, we can't do this without the maintenance workers, the bus drivers, the cooks, the cleaners, the whole place. Like, it's going to take all of us to do this, and we just believe that that's going to be the right they didn't really understand, they were just doing that as a solidarity commitment, but they didn't really understand that the implications were, as I'm cold calling into like superintendents, like literally just going like, going to Google, superintendent of schools, I called up the first one uh, where they'd gone out for, in coal country, right, with the history of coal, with coal mines and strong mine workers unions, and I cold call, when I say I'm calling for the Nation magazine, I sound very official, you know, blah, 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 blah. And I'm just, whatever. It's kind of true, but I was just, you know, like, who's the Nation magazine? Anyway, but in West Virginia, superintendents of schools have no idea. I could, it was like a national magazine, whatever. So I'm like, you know, can I talk to blah, 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 same attitude you have in negotiations, right? Just fake it till you make it. So I'm like, okay. 
Um, is the superintendent of schools available for comment? You know, uh, and the first one just comes. They're like, "Hang on, please. Who are you calling from?" Sure, I'll get him. I'll get him for you. <laughs> I'm like, okay, I'm calling into a rural region in a state. So this guy comes on the phone. I left his name out of the book because I did because I got him to be very honest quickly. And I'm, I said, so. I'm just trying to figure out why this is a totally legal strike. Like, why haven't you had a legal injunction against the workers? And he said, oh, well, you know, if it was just the teachers, hun, honey, like he was kind of, you know, we would have put them all, we, they would have been in jail. Like, basically, it was like they'd be in jail or they'd be at work already. And I was like, huh. And he said, but when the bus drivers decided not to pick the kids up, that was a real problem for us. Because as the superintendent of schools, my job, I literally have to guarantee safety of children. And he said, so if you're going to strand thousands of children, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of children, on the sides of rural roads and no one's going to pick them up, we actually got to close the schools down. So the whole secret to the West Virginia, what's called the West Virginia teacher strike was, I like to call it the West Virginia bus driver strike. Um, because the bus drivers actually created the conditions for the teachers to win and vice versa. I mean, it was the solidarity action. And I'll say one more thing about it that I think matters in the context of like an honest discussion about how we get out of the mess we're in in Wisconsin and elsewhere. Um, it took a lot, when they, when they decided to take the first strike votes, um, so there's two different teachers unions and then one big sort of service and personnel workers union. So it was three unions uh, in the fight in West Virginia in February 2018. And the two teachers unions who traditionally had spent a lot of their time honestly really just raiding each other. Like that's sort of what they were doing for a bunch of years. I know that's not familiar to anyone um, in our whole trade union movement. I worked at the National AFL-CIO for many years and it was always like, ah, we gotta stop this. So, um, there hadn't been a lot of activity going on, and when the strike votes were starting, the teachers unions were going to run the strike votes by each union, by each sector, and the workers demanded that they take one unified strike vote school by school. So that the bus drivers, the cooks, and the teachers actually voted together in one single ballot school by school across every school in West Virginia. Um, and I think that 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 impulse from the rank and file workers was brilliant, and it began to show um, worker. Sol it began to show a level of solidarity from the ground up that became instructive, I think, to the leaders of the organizations. And the leaders didn't beautifully didn't fight it, which I talk about. Like, it, like the strike had so many interesting dynamics. Like, the union leadership didn't say, "Well, no, we insist on doing it this way." Like, they are actually like, "All right, you're going to run." school-wide strike votes. We've never done that, but let's go for it. And what it produced was a historic strike. And I think that the audience will be interested in this other turn that happens in the story about the West uh, Virginia education strike. Uh, thank you, Jane. Um, that uh, this, idea of, this idea of divide and conquer, and this idea that that is what you call the, the billionaire class, or the billionaire number one chief uh, tactic against working people is this idea to divide and conquer. Um, but given that, and given the solidarity, the, the, the super solidarity that you talk about, or the super majority yeah. solidarity that you have to get to, if you're gonna do a strike, you gotta get to 90%. You know, there's no strike if you're at 40%. Uh, there's no strike if you're not at, you know, near 100%. That's right. And uh, that takes a lot of hard work, and you can talk about that. But one of the things that you talk about in uh, this West Virginia situation is that the governor had decided that he was going to go to the, he was going to accept the demands of, of of the union workers. Okay, he was going to accept the demands. He was going to not do this homeschooling vouchers. He was going to do a raise. He was going to do all of these things. He's going to go back on his initial proposal. So they got that, and they wanted everyone to go back to uh, work in a day. They had a cooling down period, and then they would go back to work the next day. Well, the reason I bring this up to all of you is because you all are very uh, attuned to what happens in state legislators, uh, uh, legislatures. <laughs> so what happened there is you will see this. The, the governor made that decision, but the Republican-led legislature said, no way, we're going to go and we're going to do a veto, we're going to do an override on his, on his uh, veto of that bill. And so right away, 
the, the union said, hold on, we're going to back off of this and we're going to take another strike vote. And they continued the strike for a number of more days until they eventually uh, resolved that. But uh, I think that's a really uh, great talk about, about this idea of the divide and conquer. And you talked a bit about Wisconsin and, and what we've been through here in Wisconsin with, uh, you know, and Jane talks about the uh, divide and conquer of coming after the private sector unions and, and really de uh, deindustrialization. Okay, you guys have unions and you have strong jobs here. Well, we're going to take those plants and we're going to move them to the south and then we're going to take them from the south and then we're going to move them overseas where we don't have uh, uh, worker protections. But at the same time, this idea of um, divide and conquer was, 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 was becoming more and more prevalent of the billionaire class that you talk about. And when 2011 came around and this decision on the part of the Koch brothers and the part of uh, these uh, people that had come together with a deliberate strategy to divide and conquer uh, working people came to Wisconsin first with uh, our former uh, governor, Scott Walker, with his divide and conquer. Yeah. And we all remember the, um, the um, famous caught on tape uh, when he was talking to Diane Hendricks. And you guys and all can repeat it, you know, better than I can, but um, I'll repeat it for Jane in case she doesn't have it on top of mind. But he's caught at, in a, at a meeting with Diane Hendricks, who is one of the she's a billionaire, um, richest woman in Wisconsin. And she says to him, well, Scott, what are we going to do about these unions? And he says, well, what we're going to do is we're going to use divide and conquer. First, we're going to come after the public sector unions, and then we're going to come after the private sector unions. And she says, well, thank you, Scott, because we really need to get right to work here in Wisconsin. And so this really was uh, an idea of coming after uh, trying to divide us. And, but what happened in Wisconsin is that when he dropped his so-called bomb, what they didn't expect was for, when he called the National Guard, what he did not expect was workers throughout Wisconsin to come together like they did both public and private sector to defend collective bargaining and to defend unions. And that fight back, I know, has inspired so many other people around the country and around the world to say that we can have a fight back around the, the right of strong unions. And I was just in Chicago last week for the Chicago teacher strike, and uh, their president came up to me and he said, you know, I got so much uh, in, so much inspiration from your occupation of the capital and from your fight back from labor that that carried on to what they're doing today. So this idea of taking an action and taking bold action has ripple effects down the road. Yeah, definitely. Um, uh, I think definitely. And, it, you know, it, yeah. So the, I think we need, we need a level of resistance that we are far we're like far from, like we're just starting to see signs of it, right? So um, we definitely need more protests. The solidarity that broke out here is, I think, what was, um, you know, beautiful, frankly, um, from far away. Um, watching, I feel like watching people pouring into the Capitol uh, was sort of this breathtaking uh, moment um, here. Um, and I think it did inspire a lot of subsequent protests. And I think it helped generate it along with then the Chicago teachers in 2012. Mm -hmm. And just watching them walk off, and that was a teacher strike, watching them walk off the job um, in, you know, the first massive strike in a long time um, and shut a city down, really. Uh, those two things were happening back to back. And I think that they both began to, like, re-raise expectations. Um, of both the use of militancy and that we could win again. Um, and that people needed to start fighting back really hard and get out of their homes and, and get into the streets. I think though, I think that we are still all played too easily on the divide and conquer front. Um, and I was just thinking, I was writing down when you were saying it, like 
When I've been involved in multi-union negotiations, like going to the table with tons of, you know, either municipal elections across a bunch of workers or private sector negotiations where we're trying to like play one private sector employer, this is in hospitals in my case, off another across state lines, across the city. Um, I feel like one of the first things we have to do, even in 2016, I was, uh, yesterday in a talk I gave, I, was, I showed some pictures and some visuals about the last really big campaign I was leading, which was all through 2016 in Philadelphia, which I talk about in the book, a piece of it, right? Um, and, and even you think, even among the same workers, so in 2016 in Philadelphia, um, I'm helping run a huge campaign, we're organizing thousands of uh, mostly nurses and some aides and techs. Um, in seven hospitals in Philadelphia from the ground up. Like, people were like, okay. So we started to do it, started working, you know. So we're organizing the city of Philadelphia. And by the time we got to the, like, fifth hospital, we had won the election in the fifth hospital, and they got union busters in there. They're rigging the elections. They're doing all the nasty crap that union busters do in this country day in and day out. Um, and we start to realize that we actually have to actively build solidarity among and between the nurses and the technical workers in each hospital across the city, where you sort of, you think like they get why they're all, we're all nurses in the same big city, like they're gonna get the concept of solidarity, but we're realizing actually, not really, like the, the, the media in this country is so beating into people's brains that like alone, alone we are strong, as opposed to together we are strong. Um, that we understood early on in the campaign that we had to start calling citywide uh, workers' meetings and inviting all the workers from across the hospitals, but really driving turnout among the emerging rank and file leaders, that we had to bring people together uh, regularly to start building solidarity. And we realized at one point we were thinking we might be driving towards like a citywide stripe. We were thinking, you know, I'll just say Thanksgiving because. Um, it makes all the managers come to work, you know, because you can't close the hospital. Um, and managers really, I've learned during strikes in the healthcare sector, no time like Thanksgiving and Christmas, by the way. Um, because the scabs cost an extra lot and the CEOs and the line managers have to actually come in and run shit and they would prefer to settle than do work. So, yeah. so we were getting ready for, we were like starting to build towards the idea of a citywide hospital strike um, in Philadelphia. And at the very first citywide meeting, um, you know, we had a discussion with a bunch of the worker leaders and said, look, solidarity, divide and conquer is strong in this country right now, and solidarity can fall apart pretty easily. So coming out of the first day-long meeting of all the workers across the city, we said, we think we need to come out with an actual signed pledge that we're going to run as like a structure test across all the hospitals where all the workers sign a pledge that no one's going to settle any contracts in the campaign unless everyone settles all the contracts in the campaign. That was like one principle, and the second was no. So it was like a series of we're, no one will settle without, and the and the without were the demands of the workers across the city, the right to control their schedule. It was like some radical stuff we were doing, um, and we won the right to control worker controlled schedules in a bunch of not all of them in the strongest units, which was beautiful. But so, you know, not without better staffing, staff. whatever the demands were, we, we had workers come together to dream up what were the minimum standards that they were going to demand in their first ever union contracts and pledge to each other face to face, in writing, by hand, that they were going to stand in solidarity and no one would settle until everyone got what they wanted. Um, and I feel like that is what we need to do in Wisconsin and everywhere right now that we need to start having like a dialogue about going on the offensive and passing hand-to-hand -hand written pledges across the entire working class that like we are not going to let ourselves be divided and conquered anymore. Like we're going to start working on like face-to-face -face structure test pledges where everyone from the building trades to the service workers to the manufacturing sector to whoever it is starts to realize our fate is totally tied together. Um, and unless and until we can rebuild the kind of solidarity that we, like I think we have to actively do it. We can't passively assume it. We have to actively actually do it. So Jane, why don't you talk about that a bit more because there's a sense out there that we can do all this with an app. And when you talk about uh, 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 the, the hard work of organizing and you talk about building solidarity and you talk about um, 
uh, uh, true solidarity and structure tests. And there is, there is an art to this. And uh, can you talk about what it takes to, to get, like when you did in PASNAP, when you wrote tech yeah. PASNAP, yeah. and uh, you also talked about talking about the biggest worst in organizing lingo, that, that this is true in politics and also in our, work, in our workplaces, that it's easy to talk to people that already agree with you. <laughs> but going to the, what we call in organizing terms, the biggest worst, can you talk about that telemetry unit and how that, how that played out? Yeah. Yeah. Some of my favorite topics. Um, yeah. Uh, you know, I mean, I think one thing, um, yeah, I mean, one thing I certainly learned from my mentors about organizing was that a common mistake um, that less experienced uh, worker organizers or less experienced sort of people being hired to do full-time organizing make early on um, is they start to pass you know unit authorization cards fairly quickly um, they get a bunch of traction because uh, they're not being very systematic about how they're doing it um, and like within a matter of weeks you know they got like like, wow, man, we're up to like 30% of the workers have like signed union authorization cards. We're, we're going to smoke this election. And it's always like, really, actually? Because where did those cards come from? <laughs> it's the first question. Because in every workplace, I've, and I don't know about you, but like you've done this too, plenty of it, but like in every workplace that I've had the pleasure of teaching, you know, tens of thousands, I don't know, hundreds of thousands at this point of workers how to form a union, there's always like the easy first one third, because there's always like a third of the workers are pissed off. The problem is the next two thirds. Um, and the hardest work for me is always the third in between. Like in some ways there's a dynamic with the last third, where once we're at majorities or what I call super majorities, it actually starts to help to move the final third. But the third in the middle is hella hard. That's when the fear is starting, that's when the union busting is starting, that's when the boss is onto the campaign, that's when the managers are working every last nerve of every worker and threatening them. Um, and so I was definitely trained by really smart people who said, you know, you got to go to the biggest worst. Like, if you can't get the biggest worst, you're not going to be able to win this really hard fight when the union busters start. And the biggest worst meant where no one is talking to us and where no one um, is coming to any meetings and where none of the workers are engaged in the campaign at all. And it's hard as hell to figure out a strategy to crack it. And we crack it by really carefully, methodically charting, literally charting, every single social workplace and non-workplace connection that every worker who's involved in the campaign already has to every other worker who's not engaging the campaign at all. And what we have to do is have the discipline to prioritize not talking to the one-third of the workers who are ready to form the union and who are with us, but spending essentially all of our time going out with a method to reach out to, and that may be, and it often is, by the way, like house calling, um, and going and knocking on the doors uh, unannounced um, to find the third of the workers who actually don't come to any meetings, but who we've identified are actually informal leaders um, in their work area, their school, their whatever it is, like whatever the unit is of workers that we're organizing, there are a set of pre-existing workers who are the workers who have the most trust among their co-workers. They tend to be workers who get the job done well, like they do a good job at work, um, and they tend to be the workers who will also uh, make time to help someone who doesn't know how to get something done, done, right? Um, and that that matrix of workers are the workers that we need to move the biggest worst departments. And so digging into them and being really methodical about it and seriously tracking and charting information and then doing what we call structure tests, which are not app-based. I just want to say that again. Not app or social media-based. So you think media we can just do this through texting? No, thanks, yeah. So um, I'm like a bit of a, I'm like, I'm like anti, I'm like anti-social media. I'm like, an, like when it comes to the tool of building actual worker power and building solidarity, um, I think we're making an enormous mistake and there's a lot of it in the trade union movement right now, like shortcuts, which 
you know, my second book is called No Shortcuts, so obviously I don't think they work. Um, but the, the fad right now is about technology. It's about texting, right? Texting is better than email because people have already decided that people get so much email, it's like when you used to go to the post office box, you know, you don't look at them. And now it's the same with email, like who wants to look at all their email, right? So now the new thing is texting. Okay, tweet them. Okay, Facebook them. Okay, like them on Facebook, whatever. It's fine, like if you're doing turnout for a rally, that's fine. But if you're gonna try and build human solidarity or rebuild human solidarity at the level that we need in Wisconsin and everywhere, that's face-to-face -face work. That is face-to-face. -face. And part of what structure tests are that we believe in and engage in every day, day in and day out in hard campaigns, getting ready for a big strike, is that the structure tests, which are like hand-signed petitions, and I don't mean petitions when you think of like a petition like, go online and add your name too. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, petitions where we're going to get to, where we can measure and count. Are we getting to a majority and then a super majority of the workers in an existing workplace? That's a different kind of petition. It's not a petition that everyone's invited to sign. It's a petition only for the workers engaged in the getting ready for the strike or getting ready for a union election. So you're not like passing the petition to just anyone. It's only for the workers, so that we're using it as a test and an assessment to help us figure out, can we get to majority support, then can we get to supermajority support, and part of what each petition does is it's around a real issue, Bosch just said something stupid on your health care plan, on your, on your schedules, on your something, they just changed something, and we're going to start a mini campaign on that and start running these hand-signed petitions. And part, part of what it's doing is forcing workers into conversations. It's an excuse for workers to constantly start having conversations with people that they don't know well in the workplace. So there's a series of deliberate actions that we are constructing that I call building and rebuilding human solidarity. So building and rebuilding human solidarity because it is within human nature to want to have mutual aid, mutual aid and support of one another. And this movement that they have done, and you talk about it, the University of Chicago was involved in this, and how the Sears and Robach company yeah. came in and studied specifically how to uh, undermine that, that solidarity or that familial or, or group sense and to begin to in, in, infuse individualism and fear amongst groups. Yeah, you know, the, uh, I go through the history of the beginning of like the, the, the first architect of the, what became the professional union busting class starts at Sears and Robux's. Um, and then moved into GM uh, later, uh, by the early 1940s, but they literally methodically went in and realized the same thing that we are trying to reteach, or that I'm certainly trying to reteach in every book, is this, the, the CEOs and line managers have a system to identify the people I was just describing, these organic and formal leaders among all of us, who are people who are very well trusted. They actually have methods for how they do it, and they know who they are. It's our side that doesn't understand methodically how to do it. Um, and that's what I think good organizing is about. Like, we actually understand how you can identify these informal worker leaders who can actually lead people who are terrified um, into the line of battle. Um, and that is what we need to actually rebuild the kind of solidarity that we're going to get to. And what you're saying, Jane, is there are no shortcuts to do this, but there is a way to do it. Yeah. And uh, what we need to do is to continuously educate and re-educate ourselves and dedicate ourselves to being disciplined in how we build worker power because we aren't going to get that through the courts or through legislation or through any other means. However, um, obviously politics does uh, remain a huge part of what we need to do. That's how we got the NLRA in the first place, and uh, that is certainly what we want to continue to do. But we need to hold our uh, elected officials accountable to the idea of that unionism is an essential part in what we do. And we find too often that we have politicians who are afraid to say the word union out loud, and we have people even even 10 years ago in 2011 2010 i don't want to say this but i'll say it that there were that there were consultants out there that actually told uh people on you know with powerpoints and everything else that we want to stay away from the word union That's right. that we want to stay away from the word <laughs> union that we want to call it something else 
But we want to stay away from that because people become uncomfortable. <laughs> and the reason that is is because of decades of undermining what it means to be uh, 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 the, the, the noble righteousness of, of, of who union people are and standing up for democracy. But what I want to do is, I know that we're, we've been here, I want to open yeah. this up yeah. for questions yeah. uh, at this point. So could I, um, could I ask the audience, does anyone have a, a comment or a question out there? Go right all the way to the back. Could you could you state your name and where oh, you're from, Mark please? Is my name and I'm retired uh, MPI member. Um, out of the 50 unions in the AFL-CIO, I think only really five of them are really interested in going out and organizing the workers in you know the growing sectors of the economy. Like the Airline Pilots Association, the Screening Actors Guild, I don't really expect too much from them. <laughs> the vast majority of the unions aren't really that interested in organizing. And within the unions that are interested in organizing, like the United Food and Commercial Workers, they've got locals that aren't interested. You, can, you can't force your locals to go out and organize. And the, the AFL-CIO can't force the Screen Actors Guild to organize the talk hotel workers. So how do you overcome that? Well, I mean, I think that what we do is we, we set our expectations higher. And through meetings like this and through discussions that we should expect more of ourselves and more of each other as we go forward. Other? Yes, sir. Yeah, uh, I had two. Could you state your name and where you're from? I'm Mike Goodman. I'm a former member of OPEIU Local 39, which turned out to be a little more than a company union. I'm also a fellow traveler with the IWW. Uh, I guess I've got two points, the first being that um, you're right to use the uh, Depression as a model for what needs to be done now. But in the Depression, um, conditions were a lot worse. I think un unemployment officially was at 25% in 1932, and food riots were starting to break out uh, all over the country. So I, I guess what I'm saying is things haven't gotten quite that bad yet, and I'm concerned that we won't see any real change until things uh, do get that bad. Uh, another point I was going to make about uh, the 2011 occupation of the Capitol, there's an excellent documentary, it's not very well known, called Divided We Fall, and it um, analyzes and traces the failure of the 2011 action to the fact that certain union leaders were opposed to continuing it. I think the leader of the Wisconsin State Employees Union said there would be a general strike only over his dead body. And I think the Democrat, Democratic leadership was trying to channel all the energy into the recall, which of course did not succeed. So I'm, I mean, I think there's all these other issues that need to be looked at. Well, I think that, uh, that every opportunity needs to be thought about for, uh, for today and tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I do want to, I do want to uh, bring up this idea. Um, so our fight back in 2011 was, was righteous and strong and was the first time that workers came together in that way in decades and decades in this country. And workers not from one, from, from one uh, group going on strike, but workers uh, across sectors and across um, all kinds of lines. And so it was this, this time of, of incredible expectation. And, uh, I think that we should uh, see what, our, what, what, what could have been done differently, but also respect the fact of what it did to put uh, future worker actions out there. And so we can spend a lot of time talking about, and I talked to Jane about this, the question of why didn't we go on a general strike? Well, strike preparation is, is, is hard. It is not willy-nilly. It is not. It is not something that you can do without that, without the charting, without the, without everybody willing to go out. Mm -hmm. And so uh, Jane will talk about that. But you know, um, I was there, and I, I know I, I talked to people, and I said, okay, well, you want to go on a general strike? Are you going to be? Are you going to be going out on strike tomorrow? And they said, well, not me. I have really important work to do. So. Mm -hmm. 
that 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 doesn't really fly. But I, I do want Jane to comment on on this i this idea. Yeah, I, a couple of things, but I want to stick with this one for a minute. I mean, I I think so. Like part of what I preach and believe um, is what I'm lately just calling strike ready unionism. Just strike ready unionism. Like everyone has to be building unions that are strike ready. Um, and strike ready means that we've done a bunch of structure tests. Like. I've never uh, suggested to workers it was time to take a strike vote until we had done multiple structure tests that gave us an indication that we were actually ready to win a massive strike vote and ready for the strike. Because going out on a failing strike is a disaster in this country. It's like a disaster. So going out on a strike that you have some confidence that you can win because you've done the building block work to get there is really, really important. And I think part of what happened in 2011 here was that like people just didn't, people did not see what was coming, coming. Um, and we had been, you know, soft in our laurels for frankly too long, right? Mm -hmm. About like not using the strike weapon. So, mm -hmm. you know, to me, that's why I am obsessed with when I'm teaching workers how to get ready to either win a hard union election or in tough contract talks. Like the first thing I say from day one is, you got to get strike ready. Um, if I'm going to be a chief negotiator here, I'm not going to do it unless you're willing to do your part, which is get your entire workplace ready. That's going to be a hell of a lot of work. And if you're willing to do that, then I'm willing to say, I'm, I'm happy not to sleep for the next whatever it's going to take a year um, until you beat the crap out of your boss and get what you <laughs> deserve. But it's really serious work. And so. Um, the idea when people call for like general strikes, like it makes me a little bit batshit crazy to be perfectly honest. Because unless you've ever led even a 90% out strike, um, you're totally not ready to declare that we should have a general strike. On the other hand, I think we should all in this room and everywhere be building the kind of organizations that put us in a position to be strike ready. So that when someone says general strike, because we don't know what the hell is coming next in this country, to be perfectly honest. It is unpredictable mm -hmm. on a good day right now. Um, having been a veteran, were you in Florida? Having been a veteran of the Florida recount, I can tell you, I can tell you that there's like moments when uh, you gotta be ready to do stuff to defend what's left of the current democracy because if it gets much worse, it's gonna get even uglier, right? So mm -hmm. for me, every single organization right now should be seriously building strike-ready unions now. Um, and we need to, I grew up in a union where we were told um, that strikes are like a muscle and that you actually have to exercise it fairly often to be able to actually exercise it, right? Like you can't just call a strike and assume it's gonna be effective. So the union I came out of we ruinized the strike. It's still happening. I mean, I came out of a local in New England that struck more than anyone around us that I ever knew. Um, and I didn't realize until I left that local and began to do other work with unions across the country, like, hey, not everyone regularly just has a strike because it's a good idea to make sure the workers are ready to strike. But that, <laughs> that's the culture that I um, come out of. So, and I deeply believe in it. And the union I come out of is still winning standard setting contracts across the country when everyone else is going down the tubes because we understand you have to be ready to strike your employer, and to do that means you have to be strike. And I just want to make a point about the current conditions, and then I, you know, I think. Get time. Yeah. But I think, I think part of what I've been arguing lately is that the conditions are actually as bad um, as they were in. 30, 31, 32, and that corporations are so damn sophisticated with their media right now that they got smarter um, about how they're spreading the misery around. But absolute misery, I actually think, is as substantial now, and the mm -hmm. anger is as substantial now as it was in the early 1930s. But they realized it wasn't helpful to have a bunch of unemployed people on food lines uh, who were organizable, so they've created the permanent sort of precariat position where everyone, where you don't have full-time work, you have part-time work. Like where they've spread the misery in a way that tries to disguise the level of misery, but I think it's incredibly substantial. And somewhere in the end of that book, I give the statistic, I don't even know where it is, I forget, so whatever, but like I give the statistic in the very end about how many Americans are living in their cars right now. <laughs> And then in and this year in January, the Federal Reserve came out with a report that showed that right now in this country, 
we're at the highest level of people not making their car loan payments, car loan payments, um, than we've ever been in ever. So this is 2019 numbers. So it's a Federal Reserve study of the number of American workers who are three or four months or more behind on their car loans. And what I talk about with some level of outrage in the closing chapter, I think, is that as I'm reading the coverage of this back in January, what I'm stunned by is that the Washington Post reporter, Heather Long, she's very good. I was reading some good stories the other day. Like, she's a good Washington Post reporter. But that her reporting was so just approaching it like dry, like this report had come out saying Americans weren't making their car loan payments anymore, <laughs> and that that's an indication of extreme economic distress. It's an indicator of extreme distress, and what she was saying in the article, and this got picked up all over the country. It was re the article you know, got picked up and reblogged, and it was on the news, and for a day it got a lot of attention. Americans aren't making their car loan payments. Because what she says is, they're the last payment that American workers will fall behind on because even if you lose your house and can't make your house payments, you know that you can live in your car. And part of what I say in the end of the book is, are you fucking kidding me? Like, we're at the point where, like, it's normal to talk about people living in their cars. Like, the, the thing that the economists weren't surprised that Americans were living in their cars. They were surprised that they might now lose their car when the car gets repoed. Like, the story was just a moment for me of like, are you effing kidding me? If we don't start striking the shit out of these employers, we are going down, and I'm yeah. not kidding. So, really, the misery is super high right now. It's just carefully being disguised. But when you watch the reaction of people in Arizona, West Virginia, Kentucky, states where they have no legal right to strike, when you watch the whole community rising up with like pitchforks to defend those workers when they walk out, it's because people are pissed off. And we need to like unleash with discipline and smartly the level of anger that is actually in this country right now. Thank you. 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 our you. Our, uh, uh, fight like hell to raise expectations for the, for the working class. And thank you. Thank you. Thank uh, we'll be around for a little while, and uh, great to see you all. Great to see you all. Thank you. Yeah.